ladies, ladies and gentlemen and good morning good afternoon and good evening to you all, to you all. those who those are who watching us from around, from around the world a cordial welcome, welcome, welcome to our opening session of women entrepreneurship women congress 2020 you all, you all know, know the significant contribution, contribution of women entrepreneurs and leaders around the world at the national, the national and global and level. level. They have they always have been a crucial, crucial figure. figure. They have, they have contributed have a lot. To recognize, to recognize this, we have, we have arranged this program, program Women Entrepreneurship women Congress entrepreneur. for the female for entrepreneurs women. and leaders. And these women entrepreneurship on, organized by Jaffodil International University in association with Global Entrepreneurship with Bangladesh and Female Innovators Hub. I, Beauty Akhtar, the chair of this Congress, would like to welcome you all at this today's opening ceremony. We are extremely honored to have the presence of Her Excellency Professor Amina Garif Fakim the sixth president of the Mo Republic of Mauritius. Let's welcome Her Excellency Professor Amina Garif Fucking. Thank you very much. Thank you for your welcome and thank you for associating me with this very important conference and initiative. Thank you good so morning, much. Ma good evening to all of you. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Before starting the program, I would like to share the program overview with our distinguished speaker and the audience. This three days Women Entrepreneurship Congress is a gathering of entrepreneurs and leaders. It perceives and celebrates the outstanding women entrepreneurs who have made positive changes in the society. So, and in our program, you will be glad to know that there are more than 65 plus speakers around the world who will be joining us. And we have more than 130 plus per countries participants in this Congress. And this is first ever happening in Bangladesh. And in this program, we are happy to have the presence of our president. Now, I would like to begin with uh, the introduction of our speaker. Uh, Her Excellency Professor Amina Garif Fakim was the first female president of Mauritius, serving from 2015 to 2018. Prior to this presidency, she was the president managing director of the Center International De Development, Pharmaceutical Research and Innovation as well as the professor of organic chemistry with an endowed chair at the University of Mauritius. Since 2001, she has served successively as Dean of the Faculty of Science and Pro Vice Chancellor. She has also worked with, at the Mauritius Research Council as the manager for research. She has been honored as one of the foreign policy 2015 global thinkers. In 2017, she has received both the Lifelong Achievement Award of the United States Pharmacophilia CPAT Award and American Botanical Council Norman Franz Oat Excellence. In June 2016, she was in the Forbes list for the 100 most powerful women in the world. And first among the top 100 women in Africa, Forbes list in 2017 and 2019. We are really proud to have such a diversified leader among us. So let's welcome our, our chief guest today. So ma'am, uh, so, so, so would you like to share something to our, our audience address? Um, I think you have uh, given my resume. Thank you again for um, highlighting my uh, career path. 
Um, but I think um, we come at a time when I think uh, there is a lot of questions, especially as we emerge, uh, well, hopefully some parts of the world are emerging out of the COVID era, some of those parts are still in it. I think we are questioning, increasingly putting a lot of emphasis on women leadership. Yeah. And uh, not just women leadership, but also women entrepreneurship, because I think they're both linked. And um, when it comes to uh, looking at uh, women leadership, I think increasingly people have asked me the question, uh, you know, how did, I, how did I get there? But uh, before we go into the thick of the discussion, I think uh, to understand where I, oh, I think one has to understand where I came from to know where I landed and hopefully where I'm going more. Um, you know, uh, by, the, by way of introduction and way of background, I have to say that um, I grew up in a very small village in Mauritius and I am uh, the well, fourth generation Indian immigrants who came from, uh, uh, from, from Lucknow in India a few many years ago, in fact 1862 when my forebears landed here. And uh, I grew up, as I said, in colonial Mauritius and uh, in 1968 the country became independent. The country, of course, was one of the poorest in the world with a per capita income at the time of about 200 US dollars and uh, right now we are just under 10,000. So there has been a lot of progress which has been made. I grew up in a village where there was nothing, and but I was blessed with my parents' vision uh, because both my parents were very keen on giving me an education. And uh, so this was uh, the springboard of substance that was given from a very early age, and I acted on that opportunity. It was a great opportunity because women at the time were not being educated. It did not make economic sense because education was being paid by parents, so the favorite boys. And um, I had, as I said, visionary parents who educated both myself and my brother equally. But I think what happened was that uh, I come from a village which is, to me, the microcosm of the world. Why I mention this, and I think it's very important to flag this at this time, because uh, women, especially from my background, we can be slotted very easily. But I grew up in a village, which I, again, I say is a microcosm of the world. It's one of the few places in the world where we have a church, a temple, and a mosque within one square kilometer of each other. And this has been enriching to me. And I went to a convent school, a Catholic school that gave me, again, my education. And from there, I went on to university and all the rest of it. But I think here I'll just bring something which I think increasingly women are always asking. What got you to do science? And one of the major things that hold women back is, well, two things that hold women back, is structure and stereotype. Now, in terms of structure, as I've just pointed out, that uh, there was nothing in the village. There was nothing in uh, you know the the schools even where I was when I was when I went to school because there was hardly any infrastructure there, and uh, it was the stereotype that we had to fight for women to stay in the science. But I was blessed with teachers who actually uh, showed me the way, who instilled in me the confidence, but more importantly, the curiosity. When you're curious, when your questions get answered as to is blue, why the plants are green, it's a fantastic way to move ahead because you get answers, the curiosity is aroused, and this is what took me in the science. Then I come to the question of stereotype. I come to the question of stereotype because I was told at a very early age that science is not for girls. And the hard sciences especially is meant to be only for boys. So this is the kind of damage that women have to bear when they're growing up. They grow up with lack of infrastructure, as I said, the structures and the stuta. But more importantly, I was blessed by, again, parents who understood and who valued my vision and who valued, of course, my dreams. 
I was given the opportunity to go to university. Again, my parents paid for that university course, at least for my BSc, and I followed my heart. I had dreams that one day I would leave my village and do something, achieve something. I didn't know what, but I followed my heart, and I went to study the sciences. I had no idea that where this would lead me, but to me, the most important thing was the beauty of science. So I followed that, and I ended up in university, and I followed my heart and chemistry because I was told, as I said earlier on, by the career guidance officer that science is the world. But still, I did it. And then I wanted to do a PhD, again, in organic chemistry because organic chemistry to me is the chemistry of life, chemistry of carbon. And when I came back, I was still looking for that chemistry which landed me in an area that was not valid at the time. It was attached to witchcraft, the field of traditional medicine, I went into it because I was still looking for the science, I was still looking for the chemistry. And uh, again there, you are confronted with stereotype. Because when you have studied pure sciences at university, you are meant to be doing pure sciences forever after. But I went into areas, as I said, which is herbal knowledge, traditional medicine, which was not valued. I did it, and uh, I created the very first database. I made a lot of publications and got accepted by the academic and the scientific world. And at the end of my career at university, I come again to an area which I think women have to be very, very aware, I think many women have gone through it, is the area of prejudice. Prejudice for being women. You are slotted because you're a woman. You are slotted also by virtue of the religion you are actually, you're actually born in. So all these are issues that hold women back. They are not valued for what they can bring on board, but they are slotted by virtue of their gender, by virtue of their race, by virtue of their ethnicities. These are things that hold women back. But again, by the end of my career at the university, I happened to meet an enlightened entrepreneur. And with that entrepreneur, I built my very first, the very first company. Again, I would say it was groundbreaking because uh, nobody had uh, left university with the idea of setting up their own business around the idea. And this is so, so important for countries in Africa, for countries like Bangladesh, for many uh, Asian countries which are emerging because we know that ideas, when they are patented, when they're protected, these data become you know, tools for wealth creation, for job creation. So I, I left and I created my company. I went into a space where the country never offered any safety nets for entrepreneur. But again, I was driven by this vision of doing something. So I was, you know, quite happy doing, the, uh, you know, creating that space where young students could come and improve their curriculum vitae. And I had translated again my idea, my, my vision, my contribution to science, into a business where I can generate novel innovative molecules and of course you know, pro producing that material for industry. And then in 2014 when uh, the country was going for election, um, I was minding my own business and all the negatives of ethnicity, of religion, of gender all of a sudden become positive in the political world because yeah. it was meant to actually bring on board freshness in that space. So I was chosen by the political world to be the president of the country. So I can safely say that uh, I didn't choose the political world ever in my life, but that world chose me. And I was very happy to be the first female president and uh, to have made history in my country. But I'm still post-president. I'm still striving to bring that message of hope for women that they should follow their heart, they should not be deterred by these negatives, and they should carry on with their dreams and dream big. Because if the size of your dreams don't frighten you, then they're not good enough. So dream big, dare, and just do. Excellent, super speech, madam. Uh, we are really delighted to know all these things from you. You have shared some valuable speech about the women for our participants, we are having an excited moment together.
So uh, today's discussion is about women in leadership. But uh, what we find the most challenges in around the world is that women are not having or holding the position of higher positions in around the world. For example, if I can say that uh, in 2020, there is a research that has been said that in Canada, the C-suit level position is 90% C-suit level position is held by the men. Although the number is increasing in the world day by day. So how would you evaluate these things about the man-led society and how the women can actually carry out and show their contribution in the society. So I would like to know about these things from you. Um, thank you. In fact, you're right. Uh, many of the Fortune 500, the C-suites, they're all uh, held by men. Now, if you, do, if you don't go that far, if you just look at uh, the COVID era, we found that over 70% of the frontliners, they were women. But uh, if you look at the, the health sector in terms of decision making, there's about 25% of these women who are there at decision making level. So something has, has to change. And uh, again, coming back to the immediacy of the COVID-19, we saw that uh, the countries that had best results, they were the countries that were led by women. Uh, so there's something that to be said about women leadership. But why are women falling back? Uh, there are many issues. Uh, first of all, I think uh, the rule of the game have always been written by men. And uh, in terms of our own, I will mention here two main issues, societal attitude and also women themselves who tend to disparage each other. Um, in fact, during in my journey uh, to that leadership position that I held uh, uh, until recently, those people who will disparage you more they are women. Yeah. So this is something that we have to, to speak to ourselves because I keep saying that you see many of my tweets when we see women getting to that position, our duty as a gender, as women, we have to make sure that she stays there and we don't bring her down. We value her, her, her knowledge, we value her contribution, we value the position, we respect that position. So the change has to be done. The mindset change has to be done by ourselves. And I'm glad to be speaking to this community of women because if we, if we take each other by the hand, we will rise together. But if you keep on shooting each other, we will fall again further, further down. The other thing is the attitude of families, the attitude of societies. I think uh, the Mahatma Gandhi had said himself, and if you educate a woman, you educate a family, you educate a society, you educate a community, you educate a country. So this is what we have to ensure at the level of the family, that that cheerleader of that girl growing up has to be the father, has to be the uncle, has to be the brother, has to be the father, and has to be by all the, the gender, the male gender in that, in that family. It's only when that girl has developed the self-confidence to say that I can do anything because then she will be able, she will be capable of doing anything. Yeah. But that self-confidence has to be there. The second thing that we have to ensure as well, as I said, is the, the structure, the stereotype. When she goes to school, what do the books look like? Are they full of stereotype, uh, you know, men all the time in, in the books and the pictures? In fact, I will just share a, a little anecdote with you. A few years ago, I chaired a panel of young girls, right? Uh, we asked a question, give, my, give me the name of some female pioneers, be it in the entrepreneurial world, science world, and you'd be surprised, hardly anyone knew that even people like Marie Curie, who is an iconic model for science, they didn't even know she existed. So this is where we need to address the stereotype. So it's on all these, and of course, societal uh, uh, problem. When a woman works hard, she's selfish. When a man works hard, I mean, he's doing great things for the family. Okay. So these are things that have to be addressed, but it starts with us, and it starts now. It starts today. It starts with this group that we have here, a fantastic group of women who I think by themselves, they can carry the baton over to those of the younger generation. And of course, we have to do our bit 
as mothers as well. We have to make sure that the chores are equally shared, but is it that washing up has to be done only by girls? Why can't it be done by boys? I will say it again. Change will happen in our society, one family at a time. And then we'll be able to tackle much more pressing issues like as we are addressing entrepreneur, why is it that in some countries a woman has to have a husband or a father by her side to open a bank account, for example? Why is it in terms of uh, the law, uh, women cannot be uh, you know, the owners of land? I mean, these are all the things that hold women back. And if you go look at the African continent, 80% of the jobs, they are in the informal sector. And women predominate in this informal sector. But when it comes to um, COVID era, when it comes to distributing the stimulus package, these women will be the most, will be, the, will be very vulnerable. In fact, they will be the victims because they don't have the infrastructure to be able to accept the stimulus package. So they are the people who will be the first out of the job yes. market. So these are things that have to be addressed. They have to be addressed collectively with our policymakers, but more importantly, by getting women to be champions of women, more importantly. Uh, thank you so much, madam. We got a very crucial two things together. We have to motivate ourselves. Yeah, and change has to come from the family. Then we can change our mindset and then we can develop ourselves. Because change cannot be possible from the outside in. Change has to be come from the inside. That's a good lesson for us. And as you have already talked about a lot more challenges, a lot more barriers in the society and in, even in, uh, uh, in the women. So I would like to say, say uh, actually, how, which of the female leader actually do you follow? Or which female leader uh, can be some of the ideal? Or what are the qualities of a female leader should have that we might follow? And then we can encourage other women so that they can follow their footstep and then they can grow themselves. Is there any female leader follow? Yes. Um, in fact, as I said, I've had um, a few lives in my, in my mm -hmm. past. I've had, I'm living my fourth life, right? Yeah. Um, in my first life of academia, as I've said, um, one of the very prominent and preeminent scientists to me remains Marie Curie. Yeah. And uh, she got two Nobel Prizes. And uh, there were, of course, some lesser known uh, uh, other uh, women Nobel Prize or potential Nobel Prize winners, great scientists, and one person that comes to mind, of course, is uh, Dorothy Hodgkin. Uh, she should have got the Nobel uh, for the work uh, that uh, some of her fellow male, male counterparts got it for. It's, of course, the double, the double helix of DNA. And uh, she passed on very, because she was a very famous crystallographer, so that's for the sciences. Um, in terms of entrepreneurship, uh, there's one lady uh, who actually set up uh, uh, the body shop in you know, a Dame Anita Rodic. Um, Dame Anita Rodic, uh, of course, has been um, uh, she's, she's, she's been a pioneer for setting up uh, the body shop, and as you know, she had used a lot of ingredient coming from nature, and uh, she had sourced a lot of her shea butter, for example, from West Africa. What? And I think, if I'm not mistaken, I stand corrected that she actually developed the notion of benefit sharing. And uh, we know that benefit sharing is now very much part of the Nagayo protocol in terms of use of uh, uh, biodiversity in the world. And uh, I think she already saw the pain and the hardship of the lives of women who were actually gathering the sheer butter nuts. And she felt that she had to do something about it. And this was, of course, when she came in with uh, sustainable development, of course, which was championed before by another woman, uh, a political leader, Bruhal, um, Brut Brutland, of course, uh, Bruhal and Brooklyn. And uh, so she championed the cause, and uh, I think she tried to make a difference to the livelihoods of these women who were gathering the raw materials so that she could have develop her business. And uh, also she came up with a very famous uh, saying, and I will just cite this here because it's very important. She said that if you think being small is insignificant, try going to bed with a mosquito. 
it will tell you how being small can make a difference. So these are things that you know really uh, stay in your mind. So making a difference in whatever you're doing to the livelihoods of those who are more vulnerable. And again, as female entrepreneur, we should be able to to drive this ourselves. You know, we don't have to wait for the outside world. So when you are, when you have employees who are women, pay attention if they are if they are sick, if the child is sick, because the child health must come first just come before the business. There's only a woman who can understand that. Then at the political level, I have a great admiration for an African lady, Wangari Matai, and she of course got the Nobel, and what she did for addressing the safeguarding of forests in her native Kenya. And uh, she paid a heavy price. Uh, her marriage broke up. She lost a job at the university, but she still persevered. Uh, she went through a lot of sacrifices but she's made a dance in what we understand about the protection of the forest, how our livelihoods on this planet is interlinked with, this, with the health, and of course, uh, the health of our ecosystem, the forest that we, we should be able to be maintaining and preserving. So these are some of the key uh, leaders uh, who to me have really made a big difference uh, to our lives, have made us understand and take stock. And if today we are bearing, well, we are actually paying the price uh, for the destruction of, uh, of nature. And I think these are the uh, key women who have made us realize that there is much more uh, to corporate interest. And we need to go back because nature gives us a lot of uh, uh, things for free and we don't value that enough. And uh, again, the COVID-19 has shown us that how we all are on this planet. Anything happens in Wuhan, we felt the effects in what in Washington. So these are issues that the, the takeaways we have from this pandemic, interconnectedness and respect for nature. This is something that we have to bear in mind. And I think us as women, we are custodian of a lot of these information and a lot of these values. We should be transmitting this to our children. Thank you so much, Madam, uh, for sharing such a good story about a female leader. So uh, I would like to ask you in this point. So as you know that already we talked about the gender biasness in the senior position or c suit level positions. So in your opinion, what are the suggestions you would like to put forward to actually stop this gender biasness in the society or in the workplace? So how can we stop this gender bias? As I said, you know, gender bias will always be there. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's been there since uh, time immemorial, it will always be there. Yeah. But I have always said to women uh, when I was uh, teaching that uh, to be good, to be recognized as being good, you have to do good. And X, no gender. So go for quality and produce the best because you will be assessed by the quality of your work and uh, not on uh, who you are or where you're from. So give the best of yourself and produce the best. You'll be judged by this. And this is the way that you will forge ahead in your career, in your, in, in your life. Um, again, when it comes to issues, structure, structural issues I've just mentioned, we have to go back again to the law. Oh. What does the law say? And how do we implement that law? Because it's all very good to have these laws if you don't implement it. And I think here again, the Nordic countries have got ha are, are well ahead because they have not just enacted the laws, they have actually implemented them. And whenever they have, when there has been, of course, so people have uh, gone beyond, they have been brought back and they have uh, uh, set the, the record straight. So look at the laws, implement them. And the other thing that we also have to go back again in terms of representativity of women, be it in the political world, be it at board level, we need, of course, a quota system, unfortunately. And we need that um, the quota at least initially, in the initial stages, to ensure that the women are represented. And again, there are some Nordic countries that uh, if you don't satisfy the quota, at least at the board level, the country will come in and close that board. So this is again where we need the law, we need the support, and uh, we need, of course, accountability. So if the countries, if the leaders mean what they say, then they have to be held accountable. So these are things that we have, but of course, at the end of the day, 
we need the solidarity of women. And uh, if we are together uh, as a community of women, hoping to make that difference to that girl who can look up to and say, yes, it's possible. So we need to be to show solidarity amongst ourselves. Yeah, so true. Uh, you have already said that the policies and the law should be implemented. But I, 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 have, uh, I have one uh, question that, you know, the, from countries to countries, the laws and policies varies. Uh, because in the developed country, what are the laws? It might not uh, work. Uh, at the developing countries. So uh, what are the common policies that we can have to raise the awareness that we can promote women in leadership or we can bring the women in the leadership position? I think your country is a prime example, Beauty, because yes. you know your country has had female leaders yeah. since the time I can yeah. remember. So I think Bangladesh has to show yes, us a few Our, our prime minister is lessons. a female, even our education minister is female. So we are having... Yeah. So, yeah, so you have to tell us how you did it, because I think you are a very good model for yes. South Asia. And uh, you have been there. And uh, again, it's a question of the glass being half full or half empty. I mean, those countries that have been pushing, they have been big proponents, of women representation. Yes. I mean, we don't see, I mean, at, of course, until recently, we, we are now going to have a female vice president in the United States. But that's after so many years of independence. Yes. We see Africa, Africa has, uh, has had high female heads of state. Is, uh, at the level of institution, they've done extremely well. New Zealand is an example. So we have to draw lessons these countries that have done so well but i think bangladesh is a very good example yeah. so we need to have a, a brainstorming session with some of the leaders that you ask them how they did it yes so true our prime minister has managed to actually really balance the situation COVID-19 in our country and even if we see the women leaders around the world though they have actually managed to handle these kind of situations and in this regard actually they are being praised by all the leaders and if we see the situation in the man-led leaders some of the, there is a questions and confusions but hopefully we can learn from them um, Mm. Any, some of the advice at the end you would like to share with our young women uh, entrepreneurs that are entering to the male-dominated society? Do you have any kind of advice for them? Uh, just to go back to your observation you made about female leadership. Female leadership obviously is quite different to male leadership. We have seen that uh, recently. Uh, we're still seeing it in the COVID uh, era is that women bring on board compassion. Women bring on board empathy. It's very empathetic leadership. And women bring on board the necessity to communicate. Yes. All right? So these are what we have seen which have come out quite prominently over the past few months. Now, advice to give uh, to women entrepreneurs is, as I said, you need to have all these qualities, as I've just mentioned. But beyond this, you need to start taking risk. And this is again where women tend to be very conservative and they are risk averse. If we are going to go into entrepreneurship, especially in a male dominated environment, because don't forget the rules of the game have been written by men. So if we are going to go into this era, we're going to have to play by these rules to begin with and bring the changes when we are there. But before we get into that place, in that, into that position, we need to be able to take that risk to get there. And uh, by gum, I've taken so many risks in my life. And I said to my husband, I've the first risk I took, I got married. Yeah. The second risk I took when I left <laughs> my comfort zone of university position to start my business. And the third risk I took is when I decided to throw my hat in the political arena. Mind you, there it's, it's worse. And um, it's worse because uh, you will be torn apart from all sides. But again, learn to stand your ground, believe in yourself. Because if you believe in yourself and you know who you are, you will not have to read the newspaper to discover who you are. So and just do things, you know, correctly. 
do things with an ambition, with a vision, with an objective of helping each other, and do things for the institution. Because if you do things for yourself, if you do things for, the, for your friends, it's not going to last. So do things with a sense of purpose, with a sense to help others, and with a sense to do it ethically as well. Because these are values which are fast eroding in our era and our So let us dream, let us do, let us take risks. So uh, you have, uh, for the audience, uh, those who are watching us through live and those who are attending our session, for those, please change yourself and change the mindset. You can do anything and you can achieve the impossible things. That is the leadership and that has been said by the, our speaker. So. I think we are very at the end of our session, but before that, uh, I would like to ask our speaker uh, any kind of suggestion or any kind of advice or any kind of policies that you would like to share with us so that we can learn and we can develop ourselves. And if you would like to say anything about our programs or what we are doing for the, the creating women entrepreneurs and creating women entrepreneur ecosystem in our country, around the world, if you have anything to share. One thing I will keep on saying, and I've been saying this, we should keep on investing in our young people. It's not expense when we look at education, when we look at health, when we look at social safety net, they are investment. And one thing I have to uh, make a plea to these women who are making it out there, be proud to be a woman. Don't change, don't become a man. And uh, do things as you would have done for your family, as you would have done for your community. Try to be as empathetic as possible because it is this value that will demarcate you from the average men out there. Because it's only through helping each other that we will be able to build a society where these values again are there with us and um, again as i said just do listen to your heart do what you like be passionate about what you do because if you're passionate about what you do you will not have to work a single day in your life and that's all good confucius speaking of me Thank you so much, madam, for your delightful speech and uh, insightful words that you have shared with us. Hopefully our audience and our participants, those who have attended to our session, they have got to learn so many things about the women leadership and they can develop themselves with these words they have learned today. Uh, so thank you so much thank you for opening our session and we have uh, this women entrepreneurship congress opened by you and you have been so amazing today uh, i would like to extend my thank to all the participants to all the uh, the audience those who are watching us through live and uh, i would like to say that women entrepreneurship congress it's uh, is a uh, uh, gathering of the women. And if you would like to be with us, then there are some more sessions that we'll have after this session. Uh, there are a lot more things to discuss about the women. There are a lot more things about to discuss about the impact, opportunities, and challenges. The women leaders around the world will be joining us and giving you some of the details of these sessions. So stay tuned with us. Hope to have you in our next sessions as well. And by the, at the end, Thank you so much, ma'am, for having uh, having us and today. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Have a great okay. meeting. Thank All the best. All the best. Bye. See you Bye. in our next programs. Yes. Bye. Okay.